everybody. Welcome to Fast Class number six. This is for chapter six. And today we are going to be talking about diversion, pretrial treatment, and prevention. So this is going to be a condensed version of what you need to read in your textbook. And don't forget to turn in your assignment and do your chapter quiz. So what is diversion? Diversion refers to any procedure that prevents official entry into the criminal justice process. So when we talk about diversion, we're talking about coming into contact with an alleged offender or actual offender, and we are kicking them away from the criminal justice system while still giving them punishment or treatment. And there are five main goals of diversion. The first goal is the avoidance of negative labeling of first-time or minor offenders. So instead of sending someone who is a first-time or minor offender to jail, causing them to have a record, we will instead send them to a treatment program or something of the same nature. That way they can get treatment or repair the harm that they've committed without being labeled as an inmate. The second goal of diversion is the reduction of unnecessary social control. The third goal is reduction of recidivism. With first time and minor offenders, we are hoping that diversion will kick those people away from committing another crime. Another reason we want to reduce recidivism, and we do that through diversion, is that when first-time or minor offenders are sentenced to jail or prison, they often come out with new skills to be better criminals. They often call prison crime university. The fourth reason, or the fourth main goal of diversion, is reduction of criminal justice costs. Incarcerating people in jail or in prison is extremely costly. It costs a lot of money to take care of these people's every need. Think medical care, mental health care. Um, they have to be fed. They have to be clothed. They receive schooling. They learn trades. They do all of these things that you and I would do on the outside, except it's much more costly for prisons and jails to do these things. Diversion, on the other hand, allows the offender to stay within the community. So they, you know, clothe themselves, they feed themselves, they work. Um, the cost to the justice system is extremely minimal, if anything. And then the final goal of diversion is the provision of service and treatment. That may be ultimately the most important goal, right? We want to make sure that these offenders are getting the services and the treatments that they need so that they will not recidivate and they will go back to being law-abiding citizens. So the history of diversion actually started with um, juveniles. So instead of incarcerating children who um, got into trouble, we wanted to push them away from the criminal justice system. The idea here is that children are young enough to be resilient and to relearn pro-social behaviors instead of being put into, in, into incarceration. The Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act of 1974 provided federal funding to states and communities for prevention and treatment programs. These programs were designed and supposed to deinstitutionalize youth who were um, who were convicted of status crimes. Now, status crimes are crimes that are only criminal due to your age. So, as a twenty-five-year-old, um, I can drink, and that's not illegal. But an eighteen-year-old drinking is illegal. Just like as a 16 or an 18 year old, I can drive, but a 14 year old in most places is not allowed to drive. So the crime is only a crime due to the age of the offender. Now, Adult Corrections has taken a page out of the Juvenile Corrections and Juvenile Justice System book. They have determined an adult amount of diversion programs and services that help keep adults from um, recidivating 
They also help to deinstitutionalize adults who are first or low level offenders. Now there are different types of diversion. Um, one of the most popular types of diversion is police diversion. So this happens at the very beginning of the criminal justice system. Police will encounter somebody who may have committed a crime or maybe they are, um, you know, walking drunk home. Maybe they were caught buying drugs. All of uh, any of these different situations. And instead of taking that offender um, to jail and booking them into jail, they take them to a detox center or they take them to, um, you know, someplace, a hospital, someplace where they can get help rather than being put into stone and steel jail cell, right? The next type of diversion is prosecutor and court diversion. These diversions most commonly take place in the form of deferred prosecution, deferred judgment, or deferred sentences. So all three of these basically mean that the individual's punishment is going to be pushed off until they have completed um, treatment. If they have completed treatment successfully, then they will not face um, those criminal charges. Now this is very similar to abeyance in that abeyance is a criminal charge is completely suspended until treatment is successfully completed. Now I have, uh, I just have to tell you guys, I have my dog on the couch next to me and she's snoring. So if you hear a weird sound, um, it's her. <laughs> now diversion has some, did I write about it? No. Diversion has some inherent problems, right? And one of the major problems that comes with diversion is um, the problem of due process. Now, if you remember back in chapter three, we talked about due process and how due process is um, making sure that all the laws are being applied fairly and in an equitable manner. So the problem becomes, are people who come into contact with the criminal justice system being offered diversion in a fair and equal manner, right? We want to make sure that, you know, um, that this, you know, this person who bought weed is offered diversion. Well, why is it this person who brought, bought weed? Why aren't they offered diversion? A diversion program. So that's something that researchers are looking at. That's something that practitioners um, need to have in mind when they start talking about diversion is that we need to make sure that we're following the due process laws. Now there have been um, some major diversion initiatives. These are just two of the most popular. This one is called um, the Treatment Alternatives to Street Crime. It was created in 1970 by Richard Nixon, who was the president at the time. Uh, this, the goal of this diversion initiative was to reduce recidivism among specifically drug-using offenders. Okay, The original treatment alternatives to street crime had three main goals. So the first one would be to reduce drug use, right? So we're going to offer programs that help reduce drug use, whether they be preventative, so that's maybe talking to children about um, the dangers of drug use, or whether they be um, further along in life where we're helping adults learn how to live drug free. We want to shift the emphasis from punishment to treatment. So instead of punishing individuals who have drug abuse issues, we're going to get them into treatment. We won't stigmatize them, but we will treat them. And then finally, the diversion initiative wants to defer uh, divert offenders, obviously. We want to push them away from the criminal justice system into a more helpful and more affordable option. Now, the treatment alternatives to street crime has had its name changed since 1970. It is now known as treatment alternatives for safer communities. And this is an expanded program, right? So it includes adult criminal justice services, a domestic violence diversion program, and drug courts. And we've talked about drug courts um, before. So if you remember what those are, they're the specialized courts that help individuals get clean and stay clean. All right, so Proposition 36. Proposition 36 is... Um, 
also focused on drug abuse. It comes from California. It was passed in, I think, the year was 2000. Um, it was based on another law out of Arizona. And Proposition 36 argues that drug abuse is a public health issue, not a criminal justice concern. So instead of having our jails and prisons filled with individuals who could be treated in the community and then released to the community, um, we want them to just remain in the community and get um, health through diversion program. So Proposition 36 is threefold. First, they want to divert from incarceration to the community. So like I said, instead of putting individuals who are afflicted by drug abuse into a prison, we want to put them into treatment within the community. So that's um, that leads directly into the second point, which is to halt the wasteful spending on incarceration. Um, I can't tell you really how empty our jails and prisons would be if we, instead of incarcerating people who were addicted to drugs, instead, if we put them in a community program, something that's going to help them. Now, the prisons would be pretty empty, unfortunately. So we're wasting a lot of money on incarceration when it comes to those who are addicted to drugs. And then finally, the third concept of Proposition 36 is to enhance public safety by reducing drug-related crime and drug dependence. So we're looking to reduce drug-related crime. So that's where the police can come in, right? They're the ones who want to, we want them to take down um, the big head honchos of, of the drug market. Um, and then drug dependence is once again a public health issue. We can put these people into um treatment programs that are going to help them overall. But what if we can stop people from committing crime before they start, right? And one of the ways we can do that is through prevention. So prevention is the provision of social resources to at-risk groups early in life to enhance their pro-social development. Okay, so this just means we want to get at people early in their lives so that we can keep them from committing crime and keep them safe. And there are a couple different ways that we can do that. Um, two of them are therapies and one of them is a program. This, of course, is not exhaustive. These are just a couple of the ones outlined in your textbook. So the first is multi-systemic therapy. This is generally a family and community-based program. So it focuses on youth and specifically youth 12 to 17 years old. So we're getting in at a key point of development in a child's life. Um, we're trying to get them to move away from drugs, move away from crime. Um, another way that we address youth is through the Behavioral Monitoring and Reinforcement Program. Now this is a school-based intervention. So teachers will submit weekly progress reports. Students will still meet with um, staff who are gonna monitor and reinforce them to make their pro-social choices. And then finally, we have cognitive behavioral therapy, which can work at any age, pretty much. Um, it is a form of psychotherapy and it focuses on patterns of thinking, not thinking. <laughs> it focuses on patterns of thinking. So the way that we view the world and the way that we respond to things. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy argues that individuals are aware of their thoughts. So we, although we might not think about it all the time, we do know how to think, right? So we're aware of our thoughts and CBT helps us become more aware of our thoughts so that we can change them. If you've ever had a thought before and then you thought, oh, I shouldn't think that, that is being aware, right? That's being aware of your thoughts and realizing um, that you can change them. So if we can have prevention occur um, before people get into drugs, before people start committing crimes, then we're going to save time and money and we're going to keep people safer and happier in the long run. So this has been Fast Class 6 for um, Chapter 6, which is Diversion, Pretrial Treatment, and Prevention. Um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to email me and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye!